You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Please welcome to the stage Mark Cromenhoek, director of NYSE. Thank you. In the first quarter of 2017, 44% of option volume was on exchange-traded funds and exchange-traded products. Yet the two industries know very little about each other, and the people who were uh, planning this conference wanted to make sure that uh, we had an opportunity to make important contacts between the two industries, uh, look at headwinds, look at things that are going to make the uh, two disparate industries work together and collaborate and grow the business together. With that in mind, I'd like to introduce Doug Jonas, Head of Exchange Traded Products, New York Stock Exchange. Thank you. on? Everyone can hear me? Excellent. I see heads nodding, so we'll kick things off so we're on time. Uh, thank you all for joining us, and thanks for joining the panel on options on exchange-traded funds. As a reminder, and uh, my esteemed panelists have agreed to take live questions, so feel free to use your app, jump on, ask questions or follow-up questions if we maybe cover a topic too quickly. We'll get them a few seconds later on screen, and, and we'll go from there. Uh, Mark had a good introduction, I think, talking about the percentage of volume we see today in the options world that, that comes from trading options on ETFs. And, you know, when we pulled the data coming into the conference, it's roughly six and a half million contracts are trading every single day on ETFs. And with over 2,000 exchange-traded funds, what's interesting, though, is only about 630 of those 2,000 have any open interest whatsoever in terms of, of trading. So... Uh, still quite a ways to go in the industry, yet in the, on, on the exchange-traded fund side of the industry, the conversations are continuous and growing from advisors, from retail interest, and from institutions. So I have with me uh, Dave Laval. He's joining us from State Street Global Advisors. We have Parag Shah joining us from BlackRock. We have Steve O oh joining us from Vanek. And in the crowd, uh, we have uh, investment specialist, capital market specialist from Vanguard. So Effectively in this room, we're covering probably 85 to 90 some percent of the industry's AUM. So I think for any questions you have today, we're here for you. I'm going to kick off with Dave. A little bit of a softball, but I hope you'll go deep pretty fast. Sure. Help us understand the difference between an equity and a traditional exchange traded fund. Sure, sure. So I think the best way to answer this is what it, an ETF is not in some ways. So I think oftentimes people say ETF and it, it lumps in a number of different products. Um, you know, but, but ultimately you break them down into two pieces. Uh, exchange traded products are either physically backed or they're synthetically backed. When we talk about synthetically backed products, they're exchange traded notes. They could be a piece of, uh, of the issuer's debt, ultimately. Um, they can be backed by um, derivatives. They can be backed by futures. Um, but when you're talking about the physically backed products, you can further um, distinguish whether that product is based on um, underlying domestic equities um, whether they're based on underlying uh, international equities. Um, there are products out there that are ETFs of ETFs, in which case there's some nuances there. Um, and within the physically backed, uh, fully replicated uh, domestic equity space, you have uh, different structures. There could be unit investment trusts. There's uh, three or four products out there. SPY is one of them. Um, the triple Qs, um, uh, DIA, MDY, some of the most actively traded uh, products with, with um, um, options on them and options open interest. And then there's a grantor trust structure, which ultimately, at the end of the day, is really just rocks in a vault, is what we say. So some of the you know, commodity-based products are, uh, are based on that, which is probably the simplest uh, form of a physically backed, fully replicated product. So I think you know, understanding exactly what you own and doing your due diligence on you know, the product structure and how it's structured 
and what the underlying constituents are um, is really critical to understanding how, how you're investing. Yeah, the <clears throat> point being, and what I heard you say a number of times, is each one of these products, one is a derivative vehicle itself. So there's underlying holdings or something behind it that's driving pricing. But there's also mechanics that are different. And I want to dive a, a little deeper in that in a, into a moment about how those mechanics can change based on the legal structures you mentioned, whether it's a trust structure or a RIC structure. Um, but Prague, I want to go over a little bit on a slightly uh, ad adjusted topic and help us understand the base case of who's using these, who, who's using options on ETFs today, aside for the, for the few traders that might be trading probably the, the more heavily traded vehicles. Who else is out there? Who's calling BlackRock and saying, hey, I'm interested in, in, in options on ETFs? Sure. Uh, we've, uh, we've seen a tremendous increase in the breadth of client types. Uh, particularly, I would say, since the U.S. elections or just prior to the U.S. elections, uh, the sort of ability to uh, get uh, live exposure and quick exposure uh, through ETF options outside of just the traditional S&P 500 or Russell 2 uh, has really grown. Um, the areas where we've seen this market grow in particular is one from... Um, uh, I would say from the more bigger real money community, so you're talking about people like US, uh, US public pensions, uh, the growth from the non-US hedge fund world is, is getting very, very big out there. It's probably been my number one topic of conversation this year. Uh, so think about people in EMEA and APAC. Um, and then the, uh, the more tactical community who's traditionally always used uh, the bigger products such as S&P 500, Russell, VIX, um, kind of diverging out and taking views through uh, some of our single country ETF options. Um, so you saw a huge explosion, uh, you know, in EWW, which is our MSCI benchmark Mexico ETF, uh, during, uh, you know, as we headed into the uh, Trump election, uh, we also um, saw a very similar theme going on through Brexit uh, in, the, uh, in the ETF options. Um, and I think in general, people are beginning to kind of recognize that there are um, other ways to get exposure through these markets um, versus kind of your traditional um, methods. But uh, we've seen the growth across the board from all client types, um, all the way from uh, wealth platforms to um, even sovereign wealth funds using these products. One of the questions that I know a lot of us will often receive on in our side of the industry, in the ETF side of the industry, is help us understand and define the components that make up any one ETF, because there tends to be a little bit of noise when, the, when traders are trying to figure out those components. So this is a free-form question for anyone. You know, could, could somebody go through and, and give us an overview of what are the various components that make up traditionally in the, you know, a, a, a singular ETF? Sure, so, so maybe I'll start. Um, it, it's a pretty simple calculation for, for a NAV calculation um, of an ETF. It's, it's the underlying valuation of the components. There's some income, and then there's obviously the expenses of the fund. Typically, the expenses of the fund are going to be the, uh, the management fee uh, chopped into 365 pieces and deducted from the NAV um, on every single trading day and a couple of extra you know, days when you're going over, over a weekend. Um, but, you know, I, I think, you know, the point is, is, is instead of us diving, you know, extremely deep into the nuances of NAV calculation, cal cash components, whether there's, you know, dividends or, you know, SEC lending in a fund or class action settlement or other, you know, impacts to, uh, to the fund's NAV, um, it, it's important to recognize that these products are, are, are really transparent, they're defined, there's a lot of certainty associated with how these products calculate their, um, you know, their, their net asset value. But, but with that certainty comes a lot of nuance. And so you need to understand, especially when you're talking about a derivative on a derivative, if you will, right? Um, and you're trying to figure out and determine exactly what's happening in the options market to understand how that certainty is, is calculated. Um, and to, to you know, fully recognize that for you, it's market price versus NAV in many cases. So to understand exactly how those two uh, um, calculations or how those two values um, represent one another. But if there's one thing that you were to take away from this panel, and I think everyone on the panel would agree, uh, it's that there are resources at the ETF issuers, um, whether we're on the stage or others, um, to support the community of market participants. And that includes the options market making community uh, to ensure that um, everyone is you know, participating in this market with a high degree of confidence and that we want to ensure that you can participate with a high degree of confidence. So utilize that resource, talk to the ETF issuers. Uh, I oftentimes say that not every ETF is created equally, so make sure you're doing your due diligence as an investor, but even more importantly,
to the community we're talking to here today, uh, ensure that you're utilizing that re resource, recognizing that the resource is there, uh, so that you can be engaging in the marketplace with the highest degree of confidence. Because at the end of the day, if you have a high degree of confidence, the liquidity you provide in the options market increases and the investor's experience um, is better. Definitely. Um, I'd like to take the opportunity to second uh, Dave's statement. Uh, we see a lot of questions from options market makers as much as we do ETF market makers. So even though we are an ETF firm, we launch ETFs, there are a lot of ETFs and our firms have very active options on many of our ETFs. And so we're there fielding questions. Uh, the questions and the complexity, as Parag was saying, has gone up. And it's amazing. And the conversations will often start uh, from both ETF market makers and option market makers to how do, I, how do I trade these things? How do I price these things? And the conversation almost always goes to look at the underlying exposure. Um, I can tell you that any question that I've had and coming from different types of um, you know, different, let's say, uh, users of, of ETFs and options always reverts back to the underlying holdings of the ETF. You could be an ETF investor, and all of a sudden you're looking at, com at comparing between three or four different sector ETFs, which have different return profiles because they have different underlying securities. If you are an ETF market maker, you want to know what the underlying holdings are so you can best, let's say, protect the fair value of the ETF, as well as also know where your risks are. And then from the options market maker as well, getting to know the ETF helps not just in terms of knowing where your risks are, but also some of the, let's say, hidden gotcha points on the ETFs. I'm not saying this to scare anybody away from using ETFs, but uh, there are certain structures that might be different, for example, like a future structure, the term structure of underlying holdings of the futures, or the way that an ETF might reset on a daily basis. And uh, you know, th there's certain unique nuances where we feel like options liquidity providers and options users as well often do better using options and ETFs by getting to know them better. And a cap markets team at a uh, ETF sponsor is a good place to start. I have a follow-up question for you, Steve. So Dave had mentioned the idea of how maybe his firm takes the daily cost or expense ratio of the fund and how they split it up across its net asset value. And that can differ firm by firm. So if you're trading across firms, you may need to know the different pieces. Um, are there other I don't know, pitfalls or, or around those pricing components. Could you give some maybe examples to people of when you're trying to price out, where are other spots that noise can occur because of a pricing component being either different by firm or different by ETF? Sure, a good question. So I'd like to start off by saying that generally the risks uh, to NAV or risk to fair value generally are not high. They are there but uh, experienced ETF uh, issuers, their teams, their portfolio managers, their product managers will do everything they can to ensure that uh, the ETF, one, tracks its underlying benchmark index, but also manages some of the risks that are out there, the lawsuit risks, the risk potentially of trading a rebalance when the index rebalances to track the new holdings in the index. But there are certain things that you may want to be aware of when you're trading because the NAV calculation itself could vary. So maybe a couple of quick examples could be um, international equity ETFs. The, US, the ETF might be trading in US hours, but the underlying holdings, for example, could be in Asia. Those Asian securities may be closed. And so the NAV calculation for one firm might take the, uh, the latest closing price in Asia, might take an FX that is struck at 11 o'clock um, Eastern Standard Time, and then that will be the NAV that's produced at the end of the trading day during US hours. And there's other sponsors that might fair value that NAV. They'll use some sort of metric or use another firm to help provide a guesstimation on what these securities are worth based upon uh, certain calculations. So there could be uh, nuances like that that tell you that the NAV that actually is published could be different from, from ETF to ETF and day by day. Um, some other, another example of uh, you know, where NAV might surprise you is uh, if a security is halted. So similar vein, uh, underlying security is not trading while the ETF is trading, but if the methodology says that, okay, we take the last traded price, you could have a stock that's undergoing some serious, uh, you know, there could be some serious news out there, positive or negative, and the NAV calculation may not necessarily reflect the let's say, the cost of that stock when it reopens. So it's a good idea to, you know, to, to, know, to know what you're looking at when you're looking at the NAV calculation. Fair enough. I'll maybe add a couple of components from my history. 
items to watch out for, uh, large corporate actions. Every issuer might decide to handle that corporate action differently. They might trade it in advance of an index change differently. So uh, that, that, I think Dave had mentioned starting out, that reach out or the ability to call and speak to an issuer is really there. And, and you should feel comfortable and confident calling any of the ETF issuers and saying, how do you plan on handling this event so that I can price it? Yeah, I would also say that uh, obviously we're, we're well positioned to be reactive, but I think we're um, quite good at being proactive. I think all of our firms are and the industry in general is. Um, we're, we're, we're extremely conscious of being caught in a situation where we have um, you know, an issue of selective disclosure where you know, one market participant may have the information and another doesn't, right? That's not, um, that's not a good place for an issuer to be. So we're um, quite calculated in the way that we're disseminating this information. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're heightening our awareness on the necessary levels of transparency to ensure that market participants, once again, can engage with a high degree of confidence. And I think at the end of the, 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 at the, end of the day, what we want is we want to ensure that uh, market participants can um, you know, count on our NAV calculation and can um, you know, be confident that when we have information to disseminate, number one, we're going to disseminate it with an appropriate amount of time for them to react to it. And number two, we're going to disseminate it in a ubiquitous, ubiquitous way with our exchange partners and with our custody partners um, you know, to, to, to not impact um, you know, the fairness of trading. So take takeaway tip for the audience would be to make sure you're on those distribution lists yeah, for, the, for each firm. Um, very good, thank you. So Parag, I, I want to ask you a question for the for the traders in the room who are thinking, uh, hey, I want to get more involved and I want to start pricing options, but I don't necessarily want to trade with the other traders in the room. So I'm, I'm, I, they want to understand the buy side. They want to understand the process. For your salespeople that are out there, they're on the road. Um, where do options come up in the sales process and, and in terms of conversations and what makes you know, the, the buyer or you know, seller uh, decide to get involved in options? Yes, yeah, so we see a huge, as I kind of mentioned, a huge breadth of uh, client usage and sort of we're very focused on the uh, ETF um, option application. So you know, we'll talk to, for example, credit investors. Our salespeople will talk to credit investors and say, hey, uh, outside of using, you know, your traditional OTC CDX product uh, and options, uh, have you considered using uh, any of the high yield ETF options uh, as a uh, as a tool? Um, and then we'll go through the differences about, you know, how do you take a, you know, the salespeople will go through differences, but how do you take a difference between an OTC product that's somewhat very different to a cash product in options, and how do you compare, you know? volatility that's quoted in one fashion here, and how do you put that in price terms here? Um, so we'll go through some big education processes for clients there. Um, but almost, I think what we've seen in the last two years has been um, salespeople uh, really kind of from the get-go uh, asking clients, you know, hey, are you using options? It's a very simple question. And if so, what for? And I think what we saw in the last, you know, if you go back last sort of from this community, last 10 years or so, it's always been, you know, top of mind for people, even salespeople, you tend to see, oh, everyone's buying puts, and sometimes the market makers are also put off by that. It's like, well, uh, it's going to be a one-way trade, but the market has changed. It's not all one-way buying puts, um, and uh, it's very different now, and I think uh, we're beginning to see that, uh, we're beginning to see that come through. But until the salespeople actually ask a very basic question, um, you know, we won't know. Um, so we've, we've actually instituted pretty um, a robust method for salespeople to, to do that and make sure people are aware of certain option markets where it's relevant. I, I would actually answer the question a little bit differently as well. Sometimes we don't go into the conversation talking about um, um, you know, ETF options, but we, we go into a conversation about liquidity profile of an ETF. Um, and we have investors who are sophisticated investors but they're not sophisticated with ETFs. Um, and so the conversation starts with, well, how does an ETF work? And then it goes into creation redemption, and then quickly it turns into liquidity profile of a product and maybe a bake-off between two products, and then you all of a sudden start talking about uh, different aspects of the liquidity profile and price discovery process and hedging process and how market makers are able to provide liquidity with confidence, and then it turns into you know, potentially a conversation about open interest and the liquidity that exists in, in the options market. So I think there, you know, as, as the, as, you know, there's a debate on what inning we are in the ETF game. Uh, you know, people typically say, 
you know, uh, you know, somewhere in the third inning. Uh, but when you start really having conversations with the most sophisticated investors in the world and realize their lack of sophistication with ETFs, you can make an argument that we're still in the first inning. But I think that sometimes the ETF conversation leads to options just as much as the options conversation leads to ETFs. And Doug, you mentioned something about being proactive. So cap markets teams are proactive in terms of looking after the ETFs, but there's also ways to be proactive when it comes to ETF options. So when you have an ETF that is listed, as time has gone on, we've seen that there's been greater and greater usage from different areas, different users of ETF options. And I think that uh, the proactive part of ETF options is when you have an ETF, it's starting to grow, accumulate assets. The inevitable questions will start to come is, do you have options on this ETF? Uh, we're in a, uh, let's say, a volatile period right now. I want to hedge my risk, or I'd like, we're in a low volatile period right now. I'd like to gain some extra income. Those questions will inevitably come along. And before the, th those questions come along, you could go out there and, and actually work with some options market makers to, for example, let's say that you've just launched a large cap a U.S. equity fund you can actually go to the market makers and say, hey, I know that this is uh, you know, an ETF that hasn't quite traded actively, so you may be worried about your delta risk. So I'm going to get a little bit nerdy here, but uh, you know, I'm going to throw out some Greeks here, but uh, you know, you're worried about your delta risks. And uh, you know, well, here's the thing. This large cap ETF can provide liquidity beyond average daily volume because of this. Or maybe you're worried about, okay, well, how do I hedge off my risk if initially I sell some options and I'm short gamma or I'm long gamma and, you know, depending on the different markets, how do I hedge off these, uh, these, 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 these risks? And really the question, really what it is, is that these ETFs are index, uh, index plays and they have risk characteristics that are more index-like than single company. They are also generally highly correlated to other very active ETF options that have, with the correlations, you can actually risk measure your, uh, the, we can risk measure and spread the risk off between, let's say, this ETF that, does, that isn't active and then another ETF whose ETF liquidity and also uh, options volume is active as well. So first question in from the crowd, and if this is your question, come see me at the end, we have a prize for you. Uh, four times leveraged ETFs were just recently announced. Uh, we, we announced that last week that we had approval for a firm. The media wondered out loud if, if this product could even be allowed for most of retail. Do you think a suitability standard might eventually be established for more exotic products? Anyone uh, willing to, to take that? I'm going to start. start. All right, Par <laughs> Parag will start, and then, uh, uh, and then we'll So, so we actually did get a bunch of phone calls on that day it was announced, and I, I think every one we of us did. got uh, the, uh, the calls about you know, this product, and, and I think a huge surprise that the SEC even allowed this product to, to be launched, um, and who would be the end user of this product. Um, I think even some of the hedge funds were, were commenting about it. Um, you know, I, I think we've... I think many of us have always sort of talked about a, a standard. Should there be a, uh, should there be sort of some sort of rating uh, between um, different uh, sort of you know leverage uh, types of products versus non-leverage types, things like that. Um, I think the exact question here is: Do you think a suitability standard might eventually be established for more exotic products? So I'm assuming you someone means you know sort of barrier options or things like that. Um, uh, even, you know, outside of this leverage thing. Um, you know, I, I think it will eventually uh, at some point. Um, I'm not sure, you know, I, I don't have a timing. I don't have any insights into uh, when that might happen. I think, uh, you know, we've definitely kind of been more the advocate along, you know, ETF should not be launched in a, uh, in a leverage fashion such as this. Um, and we've been, you know, Definitely on our side in BlackRock, you've kind of seen Larry Fink talk about that a lot um, out in the market uh, and on CNBC and other places. Um, uh, it's not something that we would ever consider, but I think um, we've always kind of gone that way in terms of you know, wanting a suitability standard. You guys, you guys had an hour and a half to ask the government officials a question about regulation. And you, you passed your opportunity up. Maybe that was held over. Yeah. yeah. What, what, what I would say in answering that question is, um, uh, and I said it earlier, not every exchange traded product is created equally. There are investment products and there are, there are exposure products. Um, and some of the most actively traded products in the industry are uh, leveraged you know, and inverse uh, exchange traded notes. 
Um, and so there is a marketplace for that. I think that the, um, um, the industry has done a good job to talk about suitability. I mean, I think if you look at the first uh, page of any one of the you know, leveraged products, um, it pretty cl clearly states how the products work and, and, and you know, how the products decay as a result of the, the, the underpinning um, and the, the derivative underpinning of the product. So um, suitability, I think, is of uh, you know, present of mind for all of us, but I think it's uh, important to recognize what the use case is for a particular product and certainly understand what, uh, what, you're, what, what you're investing in. Excellent. So we had another question come in, and uh, so if it's okay, we'll keep taking them, yeah. and I'll make you guys sweat. I, I, I find we want to answer your questions, so please keep them coming. Uh, would you like position limits increased, and if yes, why? Anyone want to start? Um, I would say that uh, based upon my experience in seeing issues where having position limits um, not, let's say, mindful of certain things, like for example, the dis disruption on the underlying security market, um, you know, that definitely would, is important to consider. But I do think as well is that uh, there could be certain um, impacts to the ETF market that may be unforeseen. So coming from the ETF issuer's perspective is that uh, when you have position limits, let's say on underlying securities, and, I, and I'm gonna answer the question a certain way, there might be another way to answer it, but in respect to, let's say, the underlying securities, um, I'm going to take a specific example, the CFTC and their, uh, and their, um, their limits on, let's say, commodity futures on, on holdings. If there's a situation where an ETF cannot respond to taking on or holding more of these futures than, let's say, the CFTC has authorized, there could be an impact where if the ETF closes its creation mechanism because the fund can't take in more commodity futures, it's hit those position limits, then there's going to be a distortional disruptive effect to the ETF market. So from my perspective is that uh, it's good to consider position limits, but I do think that there should be some flexibility in terms of not taking the most conservative approach, but actually thinking more about the disruptive effect of having too low of position thresholds, where I think having higher position limits, um, I think in a meaningful way, would, uh, would, would benefit the ETF industry. I was gonna say, so this topic is, uh, is very topical. Uh, in the last year or so, we've had many market makers approach us directly, uh, sort of reverse inquiries. I think all of us have had those calls uh, on you know, what can a ETF issuer do to help us talk to the OCC and to others in the business about, uh, about helping increase position limits because we run into limits. And um, I don't know your guys' perspective, but from our perspective, we've definitely heard this mostly in the context of commodity ETFs and uh, treasury ETFs. Um, and that's kind of where people run into limits and it's, it's problems of, you know, should there be look-through provisions to the underlying? Um, should the position limits on TLT, for example, be the same as a position limit on IWM or SPY? Like, that doesn't really make sense in this day and age. And so um, it's very topical. Uh, we, we do think that um, there should be, uh, you know, we are definitely gathering feedback um, from the community at large. Um, more and more, and then we'll, you know, I think we're trying to figure out how we can help market makers um, get that message across um, to the uh, uh, to the powers that be. Thanks. So we had another question come in, but I'm going to have my panelists. Does it? Does anyone want to take it as is, or would you like clarification? Because I might ask for some clarification. I was going to. You're going to take it. Uh, All right, taking it as is. I like it. Uh, keep them coming, please, <laughs> because otherwise you have to listen to my questions. So, uh, what? With ongoing concerns related to capital requirements and costs, and that came up in some previous panels, uh, what perspective would you provide on the impact to ETFs versus ETF options? So, so the question here is, is also quite timely because, you know, as um, um, you know, an asset manager um, with a large pool of assets in uh, a number of different investment products, but certainly ETFs, we're focused on um, the regulatory impact of HQLA, um, LCR, um, you know, liquidity coverage ratios and to make sure that, that we're, we're both complying with, um, you know, the regulatory um, obligation that we have, but also more importantly, um, ensuring that we're putting ourselves in a position where um, we, we won't be caught, um, 
like a third avenue of late 2015, right? Um, you know, many of our products are, are physically backed and have an in-kind creation redemption uh, function, so there really isn't any concern about liquid, you know, liquidation risk. Uh, but not all of our products are, and not all the industry's products are. And so in instances where you have a redemption of a product that could be cash redemption, therefore the portfolio manager needs to liquidate the underlying securities to then deliver cash out um, to, 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 to the, the authorized participant or the end investor, right, that's, that's looking to, um, um, uh, to receive cash. We need to be really thoughtful about this. And so um, I would say that to answer the question, it, it's ongoing right now. Um, and given the, the regulatory framework that we're in right now, there's quite a bit of uncertainty around this. We're ensuring that we're putting ourselves in a position, one, to comply, and then two, to also ensure that we're, we're protecting our investors and protecting our, uh, our product. Excellent. All right, uh, keep the questions coming. Thank you for that. I wanna talk about fixed income ETFs. This area of our industry uh, has probably been growing on our side pretty significantly. At the exchange level, we're launching more and more bond ETFs. I know the asset generation, particularly in 2016 and 2017, was quite large. But yet, in the option space, it hasn't really converted. We, we're not seeing the growth yet. Is that because there isn't client demand, or is it because we're waiting for this audience to get more involved on, on bond ETFs? Um, I, I think it's a question of, of the, where we are in you know, how mature the fixed income ETF um, universe is. I think if you would read the media, no offense to anyone in the media out in the crowd, but I think they would probably, you'd probably believe that, you know, fixed income um, ETFs are somewhere in the neighborhood of, you know, 25, 30, 35, 40% of the, the fixed income assets. It's actually 67 basis points um, is, is, is the market share that fixed income ETFs have as a percentage of all uh, fixed income investment, right? 67 basis points. So, so the real winner, if you broke it down by asset class, would be high yield. So I always like to say that, you know, we pick on high yield ETFs because high yield ETFs get picked on the most. And it happens to be where there's the most robust um, uh, options activity, I think, across our firm, certainly. Um, but even at that, it's, uh, you know, around three and a third percent market share in high yield ETFs. So I, I think the answer to your question is where there has been, um, you know, robust growth. Uh, in, in, you know, um, uh, assets in fixed income ETFs. We've seen the options interest follow. But you also have to recognize that there's a unique cross-section of market structures here where you have, uh, you know, the opacity of a, uh, you know, cash bond market, which is dealer-driven and, and uh, far from automated, although we're moving to the, you know, threads of automation. Um, and you're crossing that over into the ETF trading marketplace, which is on the equity exchanges, which is, you know, highly transparent, highly automated, um, and so there's, there's, there's uh, some uniqueness to that that I think is, is um, both acting as an inhibitor, but also acting as an accelerant to have thoughtful dialogue around how fixed income should be traded. So I think Broad also, oh, yeah, so I spend most of my time, actually, majority of my day, day in, day out, on credit and fixed income ETF options and talking to clients about it and education. It's a different section of the market that uh, you need to educate. So there's a question coming in about I'm going to read it off anyway, what Go educational initiatives. So we're doing this day in, day out to help grow the business. Uh, it was mentioned about high yield ETF options. So the reason high yield ETF options have grown and people want more demand for it, that growth has come from credit investors. And what's happened in the market in the last couple of years is if you actually you know, talk to some of the bank dealers out there, for example, is a lot of the trading of these listed options has gone from equity desks to credit derivatives desk, which makes sense because this is part of a toolkit. And so the majority of users in this space are fixed income users and fixed income risk managers for that matter. So it's a different area and you need to be able to talk to fixed income investors in their language. So we spend a considerable amount of time, you know, translating price vol to spread vol. How do I think about, you know, one OTC product versus the other? Um, and I think the other things that kind of is, uh, is, uh, is different there is simply the size of trades, right? So fixed income investors typically like to trade, you know, decent size that the equity market or the ETF market is simply not used to or the liquidity is not there. Um, you know, so we've had conversations with clients who like a minimum trade size they would need to do in order to trade that market is 50,000 contracts or 100,000 contracts. There's no market right now in that market makers are able to do that in one single clip. 
And so that's the difference. And so the growth of these fixed income markets is, is paramount and definitely high on our list, particularly in options, and uh, we'll continue to focus on that. So, so fair to say the buy side demand is there, but we need support from the sell side to help grow the business. Definitely. Yeah. Steve, did you want to add something? Sure, and I think that the buy side demand is growing. Um, I'd say it's only been about three or four years since uh, some of the largest, um, you know, let's say some of the larger insurance companies have uh, started coming into the fixed income ETF space. They're investing significant amounts of money. And as their investments are growing, other users are coming in as well, is that the ecosystem is also changing to support these users. Um, a lot of data platforms. So if, if you think about the investments that they held before the ETF, they were holding bonds. They were holding bond futures. They were holding other instruments to get exposure. Now all of a sudden, you're holding a security that trades like an equity, but has an underlying holding of a whole bunch of bonds in the portfolio. So how does, what, is, what does that look like? How do I evaluate my risk and my exposure? And I think what's happened in the last couple of years, there's an explosion of tools and services available to also help. And so as the, ET, the fixed income ETF usage is gonna to continue to grow, you're gonna see more tools to service that. And then as a corollary, kind of tying this back into fixed income options, you're also gonna see the need, but also the sophistication from the liquidity providers to help that market grow. So takeaway tip again from the panel, large growth area. If you're thinking about an area you might want to start trading, it sounds like fixed income ETF options are a place that uh, we need more help. The buy side wants to be there. We need, we need the sell side. Next question in, what are some of the differences or similarities? Help us understand the ETF options versus proprietary index options. Steve, do you want to start? Proprietary index options. I only no index options, so maybe I'll uh, take it there. And if I'm, whoever asked that question, if I'm answering it the wrong way, then feel free to catch me afterwards and either go back and beat me up in the parking lot or uh, we can have a, an, an educational conversation. But uh, I, I don't like to fight, so. <laughs> it's, um, so the difference between an ETF option or proprietary index option or index option, um, a lot of that I think has to do with, um, I would say that um, the structure in itself of the option. So, I'm thinking back when uh, you know before, let's say, ETF options were popular. Uh, index options were actually quite popular. I'm, I'm going back to the days of the triple Qs and then uh, the Nasdaq index options. Um, so, one of the areas, for example, to focus on is what they settle to. Um, I remember the index options oftentimes settled to cash, whereas generally all ETF options settle to the underlying ETFs. So. There, there are, you know, I, I, that's one of the areas that I would like to think of. And then in regards to some other structures, I would say actually for the most part, they're, they're quite similar. I mean, the ETF it, in and of itself is a tracking vehicle. So if the ETF tracks the same or similar index as the index option, you are getting the same exposure. Now, if you're a market maker, the hedge could be different. Um, but uh, I mean, for the most part, I, I would say that they're, they're, they're pretty similar in nature. Anyone want to add anything? Otherwise, we'll move to the next question. All right. Good. Uh, next question in. Thank you. Keep them coming because uh, I like to, to see people squirm a little bit on stage. All right. From the buy side perspective, I think is what we're asking here, which is do your clients care that there's monthly expiration? So just 12 months out for each month, does that benefit the business? Or um, is, there, is there a big impact from that? Um, Parag, you're shaking your head, so maybe we'll start, yeah, so start this, with you. This this comes up a lot, um, again, in the context mostly on the uh, fixed income side, which fixed income users are not used to. You know, we had a client actually last week who was forced to trade OTC because they wanted to trade an ER fixed income ETF, and they said, wait a second, I don't understand. Like, in the equity listed transparent market, you can trade the September and December, but I can't trade October. It's kind of weird to them. And so uh, this is not new. This has come up over and over and over again. I think it's a um, it's an issue that we're addressing with the uh, exchanges to, uh, to get that um, change potentially. So it sounds like that's another opportunity for growth for us. Uh, Dave, what educational initiatives do you think are needed to help grow this business? That's, it's, it's, there's a lot. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're, we're talking to some of the most sophisticated institutional investors in the world. Um, and you know whether they're pensions, endowments. Uh, Steve mentioned insurance companies, and they're just starting to scratch the surface on how to effectively utilize the ETF, and they're really actually just learning what an ETF actually is. 
And so sometimes we'll go into um, you know, a pension fund and you know, start to have a conversation about potentially, let's just say, using uh, an ETF versus um, you know, uh, uh, futures. And they start talking about, well, you know, how do you know that the ETF is going to actually stay tied close to its NAV? And how do we know there's not going to be tracking error? And, and then we realize we have to go you know, several steps back to talk about the very you know, specific and very simple um, structural um, you know, facets of an ETF. And so I think it's uh, dependent upon um, um, the user base that you're talking to. But as the user base continues to broaden, um, you have to have education across the board. So I, I mean, it's a tough question to, to, to answer uh, specifically, but I think it's you know continuing to be in the marketplace, continuing to engage with a broad range of market participants, so that we can you know um, ensure that that the market can engage in ETF liquidity provision and ETF options liquidity provision with that that high degree of confidence that I've referenced several times, because ultimately at the end of the day, um, you know we don't have to look too far in our rearview mirror to to talk about where there's been a lack of investor confidence. Um, I think as ETF issuers, we're we're pushing for that uh, investor confidence in the form of you know investment or utilization of our product set, uh, and the way that we can achieve that is through good partnerships with exchanges, good partnerships with market participants, so that those spreads will tighten, there will be uh, frothy liquidity, and that the investors will have a good experience both buying our products and selling our products. So that's our ultimate goal. Actually, I'd like to uh, share a, uh, an example of a conversation that I had with an advisor, <clears throat> excuse me, um, with a financial advisor a couple of years back. And uh, this advisor um, was asked by their client, hey, uh, you know, you've got me in a portfolio of uh, 10 different ETFs that uh, meet my needs as an investor, but uh, you know, what else are you doing for me? You know, what, what else justifies uh, you know, you, you know, me paying your fee on an annual basis? And so the, uh, the advisor was thinking about, okay, well, it seems like some of our peers are kicking the tires on options, of uh, doing options overlays. And you know, I'm just not quite sure because at the end of the day, especially with some of the, the new regulatory scrutiny that's on me and how I help my clients and know what the best interests of my clients are, how do I explain using options to my clients? And that's, I think, a perfect example where you have a need, you have this desire to use options, but this advisor can't because not only can't this advisor not ascertain suitability, but communicating that suitability to the client is a challenge as well. So we've talked about in this options conference for the last five years, the growth of advisors, RIAs in the options space. We know it's growing. Um, you're seeing more uh, sophisticated advisors, formerly of the hedge fund world, who are now becoming financial advisors. So that area is going to keep growing. But I think that we also have to do our part in educating uh, the users to understand it themselves, how they're using options, a covered call is not free lunch, and how, to, how do I explain that to my, uh, to my, uh, to my own clients? Great. So I'm, I'm seeing a number of questions continue to come in, but unfortunately we're out of time. Um, the good news for everyone is that all of my colleagues plan to be at the conference and will be available for further questions and to exchange information. So um, I apologize we couldn't get to every question on stage, but I'd like to ask for a round of, of uh, applause for my, for my guests here. Today. Great job. Thank you. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the Options Insider or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com.